Hello, welcome to Sigma Tech Learning Hub. I will be your instructor for English language. For this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. If you don't have the application already installed on your device, I will want you to download the app in order to follow along in the class. Exam guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for various exams like UTME, post-UTME, WIAC, GCE, KCPE, IJMB, JUPEB, Calbelpedia, BESE, JSCE, NCEE, NECO, etc. You can download the app from www.examguide.com or Google Play Store. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to be updated on new videos ready for today's class okay let's get started we want to look at the topic finite and non-finite verbs finite and non-finite verbs as usual we would look at our learning objectives before we start off entirely by the end of the lesson students should be able to define verbs very important mention the verb forms Define finite and non-finite verbs. Finally, give examples of finite and non-finite verbs. Define verbs. Mention the verb forms. Define finite and non-finite verbs and give their examples. Now, we'll have definition of verbs and verb forms. I would like to, first of all, bring it to our minds that verbs are classified under parts of speech. Verbs are classified under parts of speech. And it's also very important for us to know with that without parts of speech in English language, the essence of language will be defeated. Why do I say so? Parts of speech basically contain all aspects of English when it comes to our speeches and our writings. Any no human being would not completely speak rightly without adopting any of the parts of speech. Now, the parts of speech we have in English are basically eight in number, and the verbs are one of them. Now, without the verbs, it's very impossible for a writer or a speaker to make sense in what he or she is writing. Now, looking at what we have here, we said that without the verb in a sentence, understanding will be difficult. Understanding will actually be difficult. It's just like some, someone saying the book. There is no verb, but if I say give me the book, the word give there, which is the verb, makes it make sense. If I keep shouting the book, the book, there will be confusion in the air. But the presence of the verb in a sentence makes meaning complete. Now let's look at the definition of a verb and the verb forms. Now what is a verb? A verb, like we always know, always have been taught, is an action or a doing word. A verb is an action or a doing word. But I will always tell my students that if we define a verb as an action or just a doing word, definition will be made null and void. Why do I say so? If we leave that definition at that, we will restrict ourselves on knowing that verbs are just those things we do, like to jump, to run, or those are the words that show action. Running, jumping, skip, dance, these are the action verbs. Then what happens to the verb type that has nothing to do with action? That will be one of the things we'll be looking at. Now, the definition says that aside verbs being action words or doing word, it's also a state of being word, a state of being word. And this state of being verbs link the subject to the object. Yes, that is it. And what are these state of being words of the verb? We have is, was, are, were, had, have, has, may, will, etc. Now these type of verbs are called auxiliary verb or the helping verb. Well, with time we will get to 
learn them better. Let's not deviate from what we have for today, which is the finite and non-finite verb. Now, what are these verb forms? We talked about defining verb forms. Verb forms are classes of verbs that we have, areas where verbs are used. And they are, we have the transitive and intransitive verbs. We have the regular and irregular. We have the finite and the non-finite, which is our focal point, the finite and the non-finite. But that notwithstanding, it is very important that we look at these other forms of verbs peripherally on the surface level. Let's look at them so that we have a little knowledge on what they're about. Now, looking at irregular verbs, from the word irregular, you will agree with me that these type of verbs will not be steady. Remember, we looked at prefaces at some point and we, we saw a situation whereby we said that if something is in the, uh, uh, the, the positive, if you add a prefix to it, it goes to the negative. That is how it is with regular and irregular verb. So when we say that something is irregular, that means it has different ways by which they are formed. So the irregular verbs, as we have here, vary in forming the, the, the formation of the irregular verbs is not the same. So we have four ways of forming uh, irregular verbs. Now, we have a case where the present, the past, and the past participle are the same. The present, the past, and the past participle are the same. And the example there is the word split. Remember we said we are looking at where the present, the past, and the past participle are the same. Now, it would be wrong for someone to say, I splitted the oranges into two. That's wrong. The word split in its past and past participle retains the same. Split, split, split. I split the orange. I split the orange yesterday. I will split the orange tomorrow. So it remains the same. Now the second irregular verb that we have, the second way of forming irregular verb, is a case where the present, the past participle are same, while past is different. The present and the past participle are the same. Which word comes to mind? Mm. Let's look at the word run. Yes, the word run. Now the present is run, the past is run, and the past participle is run. Run, run, run. That's irregular verb because what we have in the present isn't what we have in the, uh, in the past participle. It's what we have in the past participle, but it's not what we have in the past. Now remember we said there are ways of forming them. We don't just have a particular way of forming the irregular verb. Now the third way of forming the irregular verb is a total change in the present past and past participle. A total change in the present, in the past, and in the past participle. Let's look at the word speak. Yes, the present is speak, past is spoke, the past participle is spoken. Not speak, speak, speak. Not speak, spark, spoke. Not any other thing but speak, spoke, and spoken. Finally, we have where the past and past participle are the same. The past and past participle are the same. And the very word that comes to mind now is the word fight. I'm not a fighter, but the word fight. The word fight has the past and the past participle as fought. Fight, fought, and fought. That is that for irregular verbs. Remember, we are looking at the forms of verbs. And one form that we have taken is the irregular verb. This is a table showing the discussed ways of varying forms of the irregular verb. This is the first one where the past, the present, and the past participle are the same and a difference in the past. The next is where the present past and the past participle are, are the same. Next is where the, the past and the past participle are the same. And finally, where there is an entire change in the present, the past, and the past participle. All right, let's look at the regular verbs. Having looked at the irregular, what is it about the regular verbs? Regular verbs form their past participle and their past by adding either D or ED. 
regular verbs are those verbs that form their past and the past participle by adding the letter D or the letters E and D at the end of the verb word in the present. Now let's look at these examples. We have dance, skip, and file. Dance, skip, and file. Now I had to go for these examples so that the definition I gave for irregular verb will be well explained. Remember we said that regular verbs form their past and their past participle by adding D or ED. Now looking at the word dance, it's spelled D-A-N-C-E. -E. So it simply tells us that any word in a verb form that ends with E, we only add the D to form the past and the past participle. But where the word doesn't end with E, that means we have to add ED to form the past and the past participle. So the word dance, under the past and past participle, we have danced and danced. Remember, in the irregular verb, we were able to look at the forms because there was no particular way of forming the past and the past participle. Unlike the regular, which has a particular way of forming the past and the past participle, but the only difference is if the word has an E, it means we are adding D. But if the word doesn't end with E, we are adding ED. But it remains the same, both in the past and the past participle. Now, looking at the word skip, we have to add ED, like I originally said. Why am I adding ED other than D? Because the word ended with a consonant, P. And as such, it demands ED to form the past and the past participle of it. Then the last one is file. File. File has E ending it. So if you want to form your past and the past participle, it becomes what? Filed. Somebody tells you to file this information. is a verb. is an act that you're meant to carry out, an action. You're meant to file the book. Now you want to tell the person that you have done what he asked you to do. I have done what? Filed the book. That's the past and in the past participle. All right, let's continue. Remember we said we have three forms of verbs, the regular and the irregular. We have the transitive and the intransitive, and we have the finite and the non-finite. Now we want to look at the transitive verbs. What are transitive verbs? Transitive verbs are those verbs that take objects. They are those verbs that take objects. What are objects? Objects are receivers of action. Objects are receivers of action. In language, we have, in sentence structure, we have the subject, we have the verb, and we have the object. Now, if we have the subject who does the action, we will have the object that receives the action. So whenever there is an object after a verb, we refer to that verb in question as what? Transitive verb. Now looking at the example, the man bought a car. Something was bought. And what was that thing that was bought? A car. And is a thing. Now your objects can either be a person or a thing. That's a noun. So once you have your object, you have an object which is a person or a thing, that means the verb immediately before the, the object is what? A transitive verb. Now other examples are the boy killed the snake. It's the snake is a noun and the boy carried out the action. The snake received the action done by the subject. As such, killed is a transitive verb. Likewise, the word attended. Attended as a verb is a transitive verb. It is not intransitive because there is an object after it, which is the party. Remember I said that our objects are receivers of action, or you refer to them as the noun or even a pronoun in a sentence. Now let's look at intransitive verbs. Now intransitive apparently speaks the opposite, like we saw in our prefix class. Intransitive means the opposite of transitive. That means it does not take what? Object. Transitive verb does not take object. So once you see that there is no object, you know that that verb 
before the word is transitive. Now look at this. We have a case where the verb ends the sentence. So once the verb ends the sentence, there is no continuing word or words. You know that that verb is intransitive. Example, the man died. The man died is an intransitive verb because died ended the sentence and there is no object that receives the action. All right. Now let's look at another example. He said he came yesterday. He came yesterday. The verb came is intransitive. Why do I say so? Because yesterday is an adverb and not a noun. And as such, there is no receiver of an action. It can serve as the object. In a sentence structure, we have subject, verb, object, you have complement, and you have your adverbials. So once an adverbial ends a sentence, which is yesterday, it is assumed that the verb before it is an intransitive. Finally, we have we will visit tomorrow. Tomorrow is an adverb, and will visit is the verb. And as such, it's an intransitive verb. It is my desire that we would look at these other verbs in depthly. But for today, let's go straight to the, what we have, and that is the finite and the non-finite verb. I am so particular about finite and non-finite verbs because sometimes students see certain verbs in sentences and they assume that they are actually finite verbs when they are not finite. Now, by the time we go deep, we would know the meanings of these two words and how to identify them in sentences. A finite verb is a form of a verb that has a subject and can function as the root of an independent clause. It has a subject and can function as the root of an independent clause. It doesn't end there. It shows agreement with the subject and is marked for tense. Very important that finite verbs show agreement. Now, what do I mean by agreement? It is important for us to know that in, in grammar, there is what we call concord. And concord refers to subject verb agreement. There is no way I can mention one person and give it a plural verb. Mr. Peter is handsome. I can't say Mr. Peter are handsome. Why wouldn't I say that? Because Mr. Peter is just one person, singular. And as such, it demands a singular verb, which is is and not are. Now, that is what we mean by agreement. And what do we mean by marked for tense? When we say marked for tense, that means it tells us if the act done is in the present, the verb has to show if the act is in the present, if it's in the past, if it's in the future, if it's in continuous tense. Now you can talk about the verb being marked for tense. We have actualized two things, that before you can say that a verb is a finite verb, it must agree with the subject, and not only that, it should show tense. And tense should, refers to the time of an action. Now, if a verb is not telling the time of an action, it is not a finite verb. And if it's telling you the time of an action, it is a finite verb. For instance, she is walking home. She is walking home. The is there is a present tense verb. Walking is a continuous. Now, if I have just walking in a sentence, I won't refer to that as a finite verb. But because of the verb is, which is an auxiliary verb, it is helping the non-finite verb walking to become a finite verb. So she is walking home means that is showing tense. She agrees with the is, and is is a tense showing the present continuous. Is walking. ING is a continuous. It's what is happening. She is walking home. The she agrees with the verb, which is is, and the verb in question shows tense, which is the present continuous tense. Now look at the examples we gave. Tense is used to show time of an action. Present tense, past tense, perfect tense, per past perfect tense, present continuous, past, past continuous, these are tenses, etc. Now look at this example. Mm. A finite verb agrees with each subject and shows tense, like I earlier on said. Now, a sentence says, my sister went to school to become a doctor. My sister went to school to become a doctor. Now, the subject is sister. That's one person. So, 
he will have a finite verb went because he's showing tense. That is the past. My sister went. He's showing the tense. Remember, those were the things we looked at. That for you to be certain that a verb is finite, it must show tense and it should also do what? Agree with the subject. All right. Then finally, we have another verb, become. Why is become not a finite verb? Because it doesn't show tense. And we have the preposition to before it. Now we have become as a non-finite verb. It doesn't show tense and it doesn't agree with the subject. Rather, it tells us what the lady wants to become. Now look at sentence examples of finite verbs. They were in the room yesterday. That's simple past tense. They agrees with where, which is concord. They agrees with where. If I had written they, they is in the room, or they in the room, it would not be right. So they were in the room yesterday. The where shows tense, and it also points to the fact that it's agreeing with the subject. We have, I am work, working on the system. I am working on the system. That's the present continuous. I'm working in the system. He leaves first thing tomorrow morning. That's present tense showing action that has been planned. He had finished before we came. He had finished before we came. That's past perfect tense had finished. I have been teaching. That's present perfect continuous tense. So you see that once a verb shows tense, it's a finite verb. Others are he ran home. That simple past. The run is a simple past. She smiles a lot. That's habitual action. Habitual action. Smiles a lot. Lion is the king of the jungle. Lion is the king of the jungle. It's a present tense showing her general truth. It's something that collectively we are aware of. That lion is the king of the jungle. Is is the what? Is a is a verb that connects with the lion showing agreement because we didn't say lions and even we have lions we would have said ah but because we have just one lion it demands for a singular verb which is is not only that is is a present tense showing you tense remember we said finite verbs will always show tense and that is the present tense now we have the man is teaching now the man is teaching now is your present continuous the man one person is singular verb is teaching present continuous showing tense something that is ongoing they were reading for their examination that's past continuous now there is more than one person and as such demands a plural verb we can go for are or where but the state of your sentence if you choose to write in the past will determine the verb to use but they agrees with where and it's also showing tense. And which tense is that? The past continuous tense. Now let's look at the finite verb. The finite, non-finite verb rather. Definition of the non-finite verb. We said that non-finite verbs are not marked for tense. Remember, we said it that once you have a prefix to a word, it negates. So we have looked at finite as having tense, as agreeing with the subject. But now we want to look at non-finite. Non-finite verbs are not marked for tense. Anywhere you see a verb that doesn't show you the time of an action, that verb is non-finite. And as such, the meaning is not complete in a sentence. Now, they do not show agreement also with the subject, unlike the finite. That we have said. that. Non-finite verbs do not show agreement. As well, it does not mark for tense. Now, this is non-finite. Mm. If I'm to describe what I see, the two images here, I would say that one is, number one, I would just say walking. Walking. The second one, carrying. Carrying. Walking and carrying. Now, walking and carrying or any other verb ending in ing without your auxiliary verb 
it's non-finite because it's not agreeing. She walking home, she walking home, walking there doesn't make sense. It doesn't agree with the subject and it doesn't mark for tense. Remember that was what we explained in the finite, that for finite verbs, they are marked for tense and they agree with the subject. So if I have a word as walking in a sentence and there is no auxiliary verb in it, that word is what is non-finite. That very verb word is a non-finite verb. Why do I say so? It doesn't mark for tense and it does not agree with the sentence. Look at this example. Walking is her hobby. Walking is her hobby. That word walking, that verb walking, is non-finite in that sentence. It is functioning as a noun. We call it gerund. It is functioning as a noun. If time permits us, we'll look at the aspect of gerund so that we will understand it better. So gerunds are nouns. They are verb forms functioning as nouns in a sentence. It can also function as an adjective in a sentence. So the second one is carrying. Carrying is hard for man. Carrying loads is what? Hard for man. The word carrying in that sentence is what? A non-finite verb. It doesn't show tense. That's number one. Number two, there is no agreement. There is no subject that it is agreeing with. Now let's look at some examples of non-finite verbs. Some examples of non-finite verbs. Now, having got the definition that non-finite verbs are those verbs that do not show tense and they do not agree with the subjects, we would now kick off to know how they are identified in sentences. Now, number one says that when a verb is used to function as an adjective other than a verb, it is non-finite. When a particular verb is functioning as an adjective, that's just the perfect example. Now, what are adjectives? Adjectives are words that describe nouns and pronouns. They are word modifiers. They add meaning. They give you extra meaning to a sentence. Now, if we say that a verb word can function as an adjective, it simply means that that very verb word is describing a noun or a pronoun. So when you see that verb word and it is describing a noun or a pronoun, you refer to that verb word as non-finite. Now let's look at some examples. Number one says, he brought the broken bottle. He brought the broken bottle. Now we have two verbs in this sentence. The verb brought and the verb broken. Now the verb brought is a finite verb. Why? Because it shows tense. It's a tense in the past. He brought. That's a past tense. That was what he did in the past. So he's showing me tense. Now, what did he bring? He says he brought the broken bottle. The broken bottle. Now, broken here is also a verb. But it is not functioning as a finite verb. Why? It is not showing tense. Neither is it agreeing with the subject. But rather, it describes the bottle which is what? In a broken state. Remember I said that once a verb word, that word that's outside a sentence, you see it to be a verb, but the moment it comes into a sentence, it doesn't function as either an action or state of being. It is referred to as a non-finite verb. We've not said it's not a verb, but it's only that is what? Non-finite. Why is it non-finite? We have said it earlier, it doesn't show tense and it doesn't also agree with the subject. Now question number two, sorry, example two says, I preferred the boiled potato. I preferred the boiled potato. Now boiled is a verb word. I can say I boiled the potato. In this sense, it's showing what I did and in the past, all right? But in this sentence, it's showing that the boiled is describing the potato. What is the state of the potato? It is boiled. It's just like saying, I preferred the cooked potato. 
I preferred the fried potato. But I can say I fried the potato. It's showing an action, but I preferred the fried potato. It is showing an adjective, a descriptive work. Now the last example says, I saw his outstretched arm. I saw his outstretched arm. I can use outstretched as a verb, and I will make it actually do an action. But in this case, it is describing the arm and not doing an action. As such, it is non-finite and not finite. All right, let's see the second example. Now, when a verb is preceded by, that's the word preceded means come after. When a verb is preceded by t, that's when a verb, you see a verb, you have to before the verb. When a verb is preceded by what? T. That verb is referred to as what? A non-finite verb. What do I mean? If I have such sentence as to read, to jump, to cook, to smile, all these words I've used are all verbs. But because we have the preposition to before them, it is non-finite. That is what we call in English verb infinitive, infinitives. So whenever you have an infinitive, it is showing that that verb is non-finite and doesn't mark tense. That is it. Non-finite does not mark tense. It does not agree with the subject. Now, to read is Achebe. To read Achebe's works is my hobby. To read Achebe's works is what? My hobby. What is my hobby? To read. So whenever you have the preposition to before a verb word, you know that it's what? A non-finite. To dance before people makes me shy. To dance before people makes me shy. So to dance here is also a non-finite. Now look at another example outside the start of the sentence. She asked me to join them. She asked me to join them. Asked is the finite verb. To join is the non-finite. Then lastly, to open, tear of the seal. He's saying, do you want to open something? Then tear of the seal. Then to open is non-finite. Tear of phrasal verb making the sentence meaningful. So without these finite verbs that we have, this cannot be referred to as a complete sentence. But because we have the finite verbs, works, mix, asked, tear of, we can refer to these sentences as complete sentences. But if it were to be that we read these sentences without the finite verbs, we would refer to these sentences as not grammatically correct because of the absence of the finite verb. All right, the last example under the finite verb. How do I identify a finite verb? How do I know that this very verb is a finite verb? Remember we said they don't mark tense and they don't agree with the subject. Sometimes they even start off the sentence like we saw in the last examples where the preposition to comes before the verb. Now, this is another example that I mentioned earlier. The ing type of verb without a helping verb before it is referred to as non Finite. Yes, it's referred to as non-finite. That is what we call gerund. It's a gerund. Gerundal noun. Reading without natural light is not easy. The word reading there is a verb, but a non-finite verb. Why? It doesn't show tense. Secondly, it's not agreeing with any subject. Now look at the second example. Giving is a virtue, not vice. Giving is a virtue, not vice. Given outside this sentence, one would say to be a verb, but not a finite verb. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't it, 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 it express any tense. Neither does it agree with any subject. Dancing is an exercise, and swimming is what I enjoy doing. Here is our task. Oh, nice one. This will test your knowledge on how far you've understood the lesson, how far you understood the lesson states if the underlined is a finite or non-finite verb. I will be expecting your answers in the comment box. Yes. Okay, let's um, take some exercises from our exam guide app. All right, English is here. 
Okay, 2014. All right, let's get started. We'll just take one or two questions. Remember, we've looked at finite and non-finite verbs, and basically what we are doing is to dictate our ability to use the verbs appropriately. All right, let's look at question 63, perfect. Now look at this question, it's very, very dicey. Mm. He says, it is I who dash to blame for the lapses. It is I who dash to blame for the lapses. Now what would be the answer? You know, in cases like this, remove the who and read without it. Because if you, allow, if you go about it this way, you may be confused whether to take is, whether to take words, whether to take am. Okay, we may not necessarily take is because I doesn't go with is, but you'll be lost with choosing between was and am. But I tell you what, it is I am to blame for the lapses. Just read it this way. I am to be blamed for the lapses. So the answer is what? Am. So it is I who am to blame for the lapses. Okay, let's see if we can take another example. Let's take another example. All right. Now let's look at um, 20. Let's look at 2013. Yes. 2013. Let's get started. We'll look at question 48. 2013, question 48. Where we get it? Question 48 says what? Yes, perfect. One of the clever pupils dash able to solve the problem. It says one of the clever pupils. Now, do not allow the pupils there to confuse you on the verb choice to choose. Rather, you consider one. He said, out of 10 pupils, I have just one who is able to solve the problem. Or rather, we are looking at the past. So, we say it's one of the clever pupils was able to solve the problem. Perfect. One of the clever pupils was able to solve the problem. So you see that in this case, our verb agrees with the subject, which is one. Do not consider the pupils because we are looking at the word one, the definite pronoun, the indefinite pronoun one of the pupil, clever pupils was able to solve the problems. Thank you for participating in today's class. You can practice more questions using the exam guide app. The app scores and gives a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. You can learn a particular topic of interest with different modes like study mode, mock mode, and practice mode. It also has other features that make learning fun. It is a must-have for all serious students. Download from www.examguide.com if you don't have it yet. See you in the next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell and share the videos to people that will benefit from it. Bye.